Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bio 340 Conservation Biology. This lecture is climate change and conservation. I'm Dr. Jeff Strafford from Wilkes University. First, a disclaimer. Uh, these images I'll present in this lecture are not mine. They're taken from NASA's climate change pages, which are excellent, and the International Panel on Climate Change. Not only did I take these, um, many of the images from their web pages, uh, I also got most of the information I'm about to present from those web pages as well. And these are both excellent sources of, um, of climate change information and great sources for fact checking. First, some basics. Let's talk about the difference between climate and weather. Weather are the short-term changes you see on a daily basis. They tend to be local, okay? And then the, the big difference between climate and weather are the things that drive it. So the drivers of weather are season and fronts. So if you wanna know if it's gonna snow or rain, you just need to know if it's winter. And if it's a cold front coming through, you know it's gonna be cold. And if it's a warm front coming through, you know it's going to be warmer. And those things often bring precipitation as well. Climate is long term, so it often looks at averages, okay, not specific daily uh, records. It tends to be large spatial scales, so continental scales. And the drivers are things like atmospheric composition and the Earth's orbit. Continue on the basics, the Earth has an energy budget and most of the energy in the Earth system comes from the sun. So the sun radiates light, okay? And that light reaches the Earth. And well, let me point out that not all of it reaches the Earth. Some of it's reflected uh, by the atmosphere in clouds and some of it's absorbed by the atmosphere, some of it reaches the surface, okay? And this diagram uh, shows you all the different uh, pathways that energy flows, okay? And it shows you, so SWRs are short wavelengths, okay? That tends to be the, the blue end of the spectrum, and then the lo long wavelengths tend to be the reds including infrared or heat. So this shows you uh, the energy from the sun coming in. Some of it's absorbed, some of it's reflected, some of it goes back out into space. Uh, but some of it is absorbed by the greenhouse gases and gets re-radiated out. And we'll go over some of those things. So I said the drivers of climate are things like atmospheric composition. And we call those things that cause changes in long-term averages, the forcings. So what are the climate forcings? What are the atmospheric things that cause the climate to change? And this chart shows you um, things that are anthropogenic. So man causes these changes and natural. And the one natural change um, that influences the climate is solar radiance. And the distance away from zero uh, tells you how much energy is involved in the variation. So the, the further it is away, either to the right or to the left, tells you how strong the magnitude of the effect. So uh, when it goes red, that's increasing the energy in our system and, and heating up the planet. And blue would be those things that cool down the planet. So um, if you note, first thing to note is there are things that warm up the system and things that cool it down. The things that heat up the system are lo long-lived greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide and halocarbons, including CFCs, which we talked about, uh, which degrade ozone, okay? Other things include ozone and ozone has both a, a heating effect in a troposphere 
and a cooling effect in the stratosphere. So up high it has a cooling effect and down low it has a warming effect, okay? Water vapor, very strong uh, greenhouse gas, but it tends to be part of the feedback system, not a driver, okay? Surface albedo is uh, reflectance and absorbance of, um, of light. So um, it has a heating effect when it's darker, okay? So black carbon on snow. So uh, basically carbon pollutants on snow uh, allows the heat to be absorbed and adds to our energy budget. And then some surface albedo um, increases reflectance and helps cool things. So if you're in the South, you may have seen buses whose uh, the tops of them are painted white, right? So white reflects light. And now people are painting their roofs uh, light colors, which is a, a really great idea, okay? Um, and then aerosols uh, tend to have cooling effects. So um, many of these aerosols in includes uh, sulfur containing compounds. And many of these are given off by things like volcanoes and pollution. They have a cooling effect, uh, but they tend to be short term, okay? And so some of them have um, a direct effect. So the actual um, uh, aerosols in the air add to reflect, but they also are involved in cloud formation uh, which is an indirect effect and clouds help cool things down, okay? And contrails are the um, the cloudy emissions from airplanes. And you can see that has a pretty minor effect, okay? Uh, and then here's the natural sodium irradiance. So the total anthropogenic effect you could see is very positive. So if you add all these and subtract the aerosols, humans, um, have a significant radio forcing effect, positive radio forcing effect. So in other words, we are adding heat to our system when you look at all the effects overall. Okay. Zoom in on some greenhouse gases. So they allow for the passage of light, right? Otherwise we couldn't see because the atmosphere is all around us carbon dioxide is all around us, so it allows light to go through. Uh, but what happens is it absorbs long wavelengths and then re-radiates it. So it's essentially like a blanket, right? So people are wondering if we should get rid of the greenhouse effect because um, do we? how many people know how greenhouses work? So greenhouse has a glass roof or plastic, clear plastic roof. Light comes in into the greenhouse. Um, the light is absorbed and converted over to heat and heat things up, right? So the greenhouse gases act as essentially a glass layer around the earth, allowing light to come in, but kind of holds in the heat. Um, carbon dioxide and water vapor are the most important greenhouse gases, but there's also uh, methane, okay? Methane comes off from uh, two big sources would be energy production. And then the biggest one would be uh, land use and the degradation of peat. And what that is, is if you have uh, things like uh, bits of leaves and roots in the soil, uh, when those break down and um, anoxic conditions, so without oxygen, you will release methane, strong greenhouse gas. So you have a, a little bit of a feedback system because as we're warming up and exposing more soil to conditions where this can break down in the Arctic, the Arctic is now releasing lots of methane, which makes it warmer, which contributes to more methane being released, et cetera. Nitrous oxides, these, uh, the primary, um, Route these get to the atmosphere, 
is from bacteria breaking down excess nitrogen in the soil. And the excess nitrogen is primarily from fertilizers. Um, and then there's CFCs. Um, these are the uh, refrigerants that were used, uh, but they're still used in industry and they're still out in the atmosphere. And there's other greenhouse gases, but there's they tend to be minor. Okay. Uh, one important thing to understand is that we we need to have greenhouse gases, and uh, it's important to understand that the greenhouse gases we have naturally keep the earth at an average of 13 C. Okay, that's in the 60s. So without green, the greenhouse effect, um, where you don't have an atmosphere like this, places like Mars, it gets super hot during the day and super cold at night. And the greenhouse gases, because they re radiate heat, they stabilize the planet. And so naturally there's a level of greenhouse gases and what we're doing to it is adding to it. And we call that the anthropogenically enha enhanced greenhouse effect. So it's a little bit, but it's significant enough to have some major consequences. Okay, the effects of climate change on temperature. So we've been adding uh, CO2 the, from the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases, which has caused an increase in temperature. Uh, the marker we use is the, the late 19th century. We can go back further, but this is where we consider the start of our effect. Uh, since the late 19th century, so 1850-ish, uh, the Earth has warmed uh, two degrees Fahrenheit or about 1.14 degrees Celsius, okay? And uh, most of that warming has been in the last 40 years. So what this is, is a start of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution started when we started burning coal en masse uh, for steam production so we could run things like factories and also to warm homes, okay? So if you look at uh, the change since 1880, since the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution, relatively stable temperatures, and then it starts to go up and then really picks up. And if you look at the green line, you have annual mean temperatures and notice it bounces up. So there is some noise, but it's bouncing up and up and uh, increasing. Lowest smoothing means if you were to take an average and include a, a window, so not just one year, not one annual mean, uh, usually they'll tell you uh, with lowest smoothing what the window is. So it might be five years. When what you do is you take a five-year average of any point so when you move along, you'll add the next year's average, but you'll bump out the next and you just take an average. And what that does is it smooths it a bit so you can see uh, longer term patterns. And if you were to make this um, 50 year um, smoothing, it would be even smoother. You may not even detect that bump in the middle, but you would still see, even if you were smooth for 50 years, you would still see an increase and it's starting to, the rate is actually increasing, okay, towards the end. And this smaller graph, I'm showing you that um, there's been some criticism of looking at uh, climate since the Industrial Revolution. So different groups have uh, measured uh, the Earth's temperature, and this shows you the the agreement among different parties that have have done this. Okay, so it doesn't matter who does it, we all end up with the same conclusion. And the data is very, very, um, there's a lot of convergence of data, which means they're showing exactly the same thing. Okay, now the effects of car, not the effects of carbon dioxide, but just carbon dioxide in general. So carbon dioxide goes through some cycles and this data goes back 
uh, the graph on the left goes back 800,000 years, right? And the way they get that data is from ice cores. So you drill down in an ice core and um, there are bubbles that capture the air at that time. And you can actually um, measure the carbon dioxide at that time period. Really remarkable. Um, and you can do this over places, um, Antarctic and Arctic, and you can start to see that there's convergence in or different places in the Antarctic. And you can start to see that these numbers are, are agreeing. So it's, it's a reliable method of reconstructing carbon dioxide in a cycle. And you can see that it does cycle indeed. Okay. So two criticisms to when you're talking about climate change to the public, there's often two things that come out is one, it's a solar cycle. And you can see that the changes in the solar cycle have very little to do with climate uh, change, at least on the, uh, the, the range of time we're talking about. Maybe over millions of years, the this, this solar cycles mean something, but in the short term, they really contribute very little to, um, to climate and carbon dioxide cycles as well. And you could see in this graph, carbon dioxide does cycle up and down, up and down. And uh, some of these changes are associated with uh, the many ice ages that we've had. And you can see that carbon dioxide uh, started to shoot up and now we are far exceeding any level we have seen in the past 800,000 years. So it's pretty clear uh, that there's an increase and pretty clear that we're doing it. Okay, on a smaller time scale, you can see that carbon dioxide also cycles up and down. And these smaller cycles are due to uh, seasonal changes uh, in their northern hemisphere. If you look at where most of the land is and where most of the deciduous plants are, they tend to be in the northern hemisphere. So when it greens up across uh, Russia, United States, and Canada, uh, and China as well, they absorb carbon dioxide and it dips down. And then winter comes, they drop the leaves in, in decomposition and carbon dioxide dips up and then dips down. So these are seasonal cycles you'll see. And you could see that, um, well, here's an amazing thing. When I taught this course, my first semester at Wilkes University was 2007. I taught, <laughs> taught, I taught this course that fall and I think uh, it was 381 or 384 parts per million uh, was carbon dioxide. And as I teach this today, um, carbon dioxide is uh, over 410 parts per million and there's no sign of it declining as well. So there's the, there's your slope. And so just extend that out. Okay, just more on some solar activity. So uh, you can do some reconstructions of solar activity and there's actually some visual records of solar radiance. And you can see that it's gone up and goes down and there are cycles to it, okay? But you can see the disconnect between solar radiance, which has actually gone down and the temperature has actually gone up. Okay, trends of CO2. Uh, so, uh, forestry contributes and other land uses, and that would be agriculture. So how we use our land actually contributes to CO2 emissions. And uh, the other one is uh, fossil fuels and then cement um, is actually a huge greenhouse gas emitter uh, because to build cement uh, you actually have to heat up things and then there's directly and then carbon dioxide is released from the products. So uh, cement production is a huge one, but most of it is fossil fuels. So 
fossil fuels, just as a reminder, what they are is coal and gas, right? And then I let's broaden gas to just petroleum. Petroleum uh, is the product of uh, marine organisms like diatoms that absorb carbon dioxide, they turn it into diatoms and their bodies sink to the bottom and that cytoplasm is converted to oil, right? So it's, it's not dinosaurs, right? Uh, petroleum comes from marine diatoms and it's, it's millions and millions of years of their bodies being built up, squeezed, converted into petroleum. It gets covered up right, by sediment, and then we drill down and go get it, okay? So that's one form of fossil fuel. The other fossil fuel is uh, carbon. Most of the carbon comes from a time period, this is gonna sound crazy, the Carboniferous. So during the Carboniferous, it was warm and wet in the, um, on Earth, but very little oxygen. So what happened was during the Carboniferous, you had these uh, pre-angiosperm uh, swamps with lots and lots of plants and those died. And because oxygen was lower, the carbon dioxide was not given off. It became coal. So you had plants become peat and then through time that peat becomes coal, right? And we actually have uh, samples through with that whole time period, right? Because that continues. And uh, we have peat formation now uh, up in Canada and we can mine peat and burn peat. Uh, but the fossil fuel itself is primarily coal and uh, petroleum. Again, that was CO2 in the past absorbed into plants and organisms. And we're now we're taking that that carbon dioxide that was fixed, right, by photosynthesis. 360 uh, some odd years ago, and now we're putting that all back into the atmosphere, okay? So that's where most of it's coming from. Uh, flaring is when you're doing, say, uh, natural gas extraction, uh, you burn off I have to release some of the pressure and you actually burn off the methane. Some of the methane doesn't burn some of the, and then the methane's converted to CO2. So there's, there's some uh, greenhouse gas production there as well. So here's the trend. So um, you had the human population started to increase. We're using more land and farming and then fossil fuels start to be burned during the, um, so you have the start of the industrial revolution where we start burning uh, coal, oil's discovered and we uh, find a way to produce it in mass and that kicks up. And then uh, you can see the rates of greenhouse gas, primarily CO2 emissions, how that really has been picking up um, exponentially towards the end. And uh, so here's the difference between uh, 1750 and 1970, and then how it looks 19 or 1750 to 2011. So the rate of carbon dioxide emission has really picked up in the, in the last um, 30, 40 years. Okay, so where, what sectors um, of the economy are producing uh, most of the CO2? So AFOLU is agriculture, forestry, and other land use. So things like rice fields and um, other things that produce methane and CO2, okay? that is a huge contributor to sort of the, the global CO2 emissions. Uh, agriculture, forestry, and other land use. So just how we use the land. Uh, industry, 21%. Uh, transports, 14%. So this is you driving your car. Okay. 
14%. So not the biggest chunk, but a chunk, right? Uh, buildings and uh, contribute 6.4. And then another big chunk is indirect. Um, so industry, transport, and buildings, right? So this indirect production of CO2 um, is also big. But the biggest ones, industry of direct industry um, and ag. So if we can figure out how to reduce these, we would figure out how to take a, a huge hit out of... Um, out of the CO2 emissions, okay. Okay, so CO2 is increasing, leads to um, increase in temperatures. It's not, first of all, it's not smooth. So the increase in temperatures you should know is more towards the North Pole than anywhere else. So we're seeing climate change more in the Arctic and in Alaska than anywhere else. So that uh, 1.1 degree Celsius increase, most of that is towards the Arctic and less so. So that is a global average. Most of it is towards the North. Um, but we will see a change in temperature overall. Uh, we'll also see a change in precipitation patterns. Okay, so uh, the prediction for Pennsylvania is that there's going to be an increase in precipitation, but more drought. How do you get how do you get more drought, and more precipitation, more precipitation at the same time? What we're going to get is periods of drought followed by periods of of heavy heavy rain. So we're going to have flooding and drought issues instead of say every couple of days having a light rain, it'll be drought followed by heavy rains. And um, in my personal experience, we are already seeing this. Okay, I've seen drought conditions in this state. Um, I, I've never seen when you walk through the woods and all the understories dying is, is kind of a strange thing to see. I saw it this year. Acorn production is way, way, way down. And uh, I I think it really depends when you're talking about effects on vegetation on when the heavy rains occur. Okay, if it occurs during the growing season, it can buffer some of those droughts. If it occurs outside the growing season, uh, the droughts will be become worse. Okay, and then looking beyond Pennsylvania, loss of sea ice and land ice. So sea ice is up in the Arctic. There's no continent there. So when it freezes over, that's considered to be sea ice. In the Antarctic, you have some sea ice, but a, but covering Antarctica is land ice. So a lot of that's melting. You also have land ice in Greenland and Iceland, and a lot of that is melting as well. So when land ice melts, uh, that contributes to sea level, right? It's like uh, having ice on a sheet melt into your cup. The, the sea ice that... Uh, melts doesn't contribute directly to sea level rise, but because of thermal expansion, even adding more water uh, that was in the form of ice uh, contributes a little bit to uh, sea level rise, but most of it is from uh, land ice dumping water into the oceans. And the other thing we'll see is an increase in the strength of hurricanes. Um, it was kind of contentious for the past couple of years, the models looking at the frequency of hurricanes, some predicted yes, some predicted no, but the agreement was uh, because the Gulf of Mexico is going to be warmer that, and so that's how hurricanes build up their energy is mostly in the Gulf. So when it hit the Gulf and it's warm, they will pack a punch and, uh, and that's what's been happening. So the Gulf is getting warmer and warmer. And so hurricanes are getting stronger and stronger. Okay. What does this mean? So what does increase in temperature and sea level rise mean for uh, organisms and more broadly uh, ecological communities? 
One is there's going to be a shift of biomes towards higher latitudes. Um, so here's a, a biome map. So here's Eastern deciduous forest, this big green area. We have the uh, grasslands and then some desert and scrub. And um, you have evergreen forest here. Uh, this light blue swath going across Canada is boreal forest. And what's going to happen is boreal forest is going to march north. You have tundra up top here. Tundra is going to move up. Uh, grasslands are going to move up. And then our this shrubland, dry shrubland, is going to move into the U.S. Okay. So this grassland belt, the prairie, is a highly productive agriculture, and that's going to shift north into Canada, and this more scrubby, less productive um, climate biome is going to move up into the U.S. So that's going to affect ag production. Um, so there's going to be a loss. So we're just going to have these things shift. So eastern deciduous forest is going to shift up. You have a little bit of tropical habitat here. That's going to expand. Uh, but things are as far north as you can get. So things like the tundra um, have no place to go. They can't shift more north because they're already at the north. So they're going to be crowded out by things like boreal forests. Okay. So we're just going to lose that habitat. Uh, and then, so that's over the globe. If you look at mountains, uh, what you're going to get is a shift north. So we know, for example, that as you move for every thousand meters, you move up, uh, the temperature drops, drops 9.8 degrees Celsius. So you can go to places. This is Cotopaxi, this mountain right here is Cotopaxi in um, Ecuador. And although you are essentially on the equator, you are high enough up that you get snow. So you get snow permanently, then sort of tundra habitat. And then you get this sort of short scrubby forest um, down below. And what will happen is we're gonna lose this snow. So we already know places like Kilimanjaro uh, are losing their snow cover and uh, glaciers in Mexico, which still blows my mind, are we're losing those rapidly as well, unfortunately. And you can imagine this snow cover was was much higher in extent, and uh, the snow's marching up, and eventually this will be free of snow, and uh, these biomes will will creep up as well. So if you have, so there's a type of habitat in the tropics called paramo. Paramo is really high elevation um, habitat. You have a number of endangered plants and, and animals that only live in paramo and that habitat will be gone and those animals will be extinct. All right. So we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere uh, much of that will be absorbed by our oceans. In fact, our oceans are reaching their capacity. So the rate at which they're absorbing CO2 is slowing down. They're still able to absorb most of our carbon dioxide, right? So the, the carbon dioxide we give off, if you think about it, will go into the atmosphere, become part of the atmosphere. It can go into the ocean or it can get fixed in plants. So those are the three fates of carbon dioxide. So the ocean absorbs much of the carbon dioxide we give off, but the rate at which uh, it's absorbing CO2 is reaching a limit, okay, as, as you would expect. Uh, but when CO2 is absorbed into the ocean, it forms carbonic acid, okay? So the oceans are acidifying. And one big issue is that plants, not plants, sorry, the organisms that use uh, calcium, calcium carbamate, to th make things like shells. So uh, here's a rock on a New Jersey jetty uh, covered in uh, looks like barnacles and blue mussels that as the ocean becomes more acidic, 
it's harder for those organisms to acquire calcium, okay? And in fact, it can leach out. And we know that things that um, are at the bottom of the food chain, okay, um, mostly the diatoms, that their composition with ocean acidification is actually changing. So we are affecting the very base of the food chain. And how that ripples up, um, the long-term effects, we're just not sure. But, uh, you know, the marine ecosystem's relatively important for the human condition, if you think about it. Um, so we'll see what, what type of effects this will have in the future. Okay, and if you remember that you have the land ice is melting and contributing to sea level rise. Uh, so this chart at the bottom shows you the sea level change from 1880 and the it's interesting because this is not metric, uh, but this shows you the sea level change in interest in interest uh, globally, and um, again, this is not necessarily smooth. A lot of this sea level change um, has to do with the way that oceans are distributed. Um, but the interesting thing is, if you look at the um, at the change, it's been significant. And you think like, you know, a few inches, a few centimeters of ocean level rise, what, is, what does that mean? Like, a, is it so what? If you look at the slope of land, uh, particularly on low-lying coastal areas, that eight inches up may mean several feet going in. So if you are relatively flat, that if you have a storm surge or something, add to that going up, that that water can move in that much farther because of the slope, right? So places up in Maine that have a rocky coast, these changes won't mean much, but on low-lying uh, places like Miami, um, certainly we've seen this in New Orleans already, that a little bit can mean, uh, can have devastating effects. Okay, so what we'll see in the future is mass migration of people um, we're just starting to see the United Nations recognize um, uh, climate, mi climate migration, recognizing uh, climate refugees, so people that live in low-lying places. Um, they're just starting to get to the point where some islands are no longer livable. And that, that trend will continue. In fact, it's this, the slope of this line is actually increasing as you go along. So sea level rise will get faster and faster as we go along, given, given current conditions. So we're gonna see the loss of island habitats. And here's the, the crux of the extent of the effect. So barrier islands protect the inland from uh, things like hurricanes. So they provide an ecosystem service. They themselves provide a service because you can drive out on barrier islands, you can you can put houses on barrier islands. And then the question is, as sea level rises and starts to cover barrier islands, they can shift inwards, right? But the question is, does the rate of barrier island formation, does it keep up with sea level rise or is it less? So that we have to understand. Mangroves, hugely important because these act as one buffers for hurricanes and tropical storms. And also these are important habitats, not only, you know, as, as a habitat per se for, for many organisms, they are important for fisheries because these are where young fish will go in and become big, yummy, delicious fish. And the question is, can, uh, as a habitat, can mangroves shift? So they're gonna shift north because they're only associated with warm weathers. Can, can the rate at which, you know, seeds are dropped, mangroves grow, drop another seed, that thing grow, can that shift in movement of mangroves keep up with sea level change? And that we just don't know. Okay. 
So there's some of the effects of climate change has on our systems. There's things I didn't cover, which is like direct effects. So longer heat waves, longer droughts will have direct effects on people and animals and plants. And we've seen the uh, direct effects on people. There's been some extended heat waves um, that have killed tens of thousands of people in France for some reason. You hear about these things and then they tend to go away. So it's gonna, uh, climate change, by the way, is gonna hurt our poorest people because those are the people that don't have air conditioning. These are the people that can't move, right? So climate change will not affect everyone equally. But there are things like droughts, affect plants, affect animals, there is a direct effect of climate change on those things. All right. There is natural variability um, in the climate. It does change naturally, but we are driving most of the change now. Um, so future climate change depends on us, right? I don't mean just you and me, I mean, the entire population, industry, transport, how we use land. So there are climate models, and I want to go into these in any detail. You can actually take a class here at Wilkes University just modeling climate. Uh, but here's what I want to say is uh, what you can do is you can build any climate model. You can build the model of how it goes into the future. And then, so you call that a forecast. And then what you can do is run it backwards. So these things are based on physics. The, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air, nitrous oxide, methane, land use, all those things. So you can actually say, uh, based on these things, what were temperatures like in the past? That's called hind casting. And hind casting, unless you want to wait, is how you check your models. And so if you built mo if you built the model in 2000, right, you can actually run it backwards to see how well it runs. And so you can look at our observations of temperature change. And then the, so an ensemble mean means you run a bunch of simulations and you run a mean response because there's uncertainties in the model. So the error associated with it. And so you can see here's the mean and it's, it tracks observations fairly well. If you look at the, um, the confidence intervals in the model, you can see that uh, it's fairly wide, but you can definitely see that the whole trend is moving upwards, even with the air, okay? And then looking forward, uh, so these models that were run in 2000, now we have 20 years of data, we can check them. And you can see the, the mean is relatively smooth, but increasing, the observations are increasing. The air is pretty wide, but again, all of it's going up. So it's bouncing within that air and uh, all that's going up. So if you look at where we are now, even with the air and where we've been, you can see there's very little overlap from 1970, 1970 to 2020. There's my lifetime. All right. What a downer. So like I said, we will decide what our climate looks like in the future. What we, the royal we, the humans. And uh, looking at some long-term model averages, uh, there's different simulations. So what you have to do is say like, what if things just continue as is with the increase in, in industry and in transport, the human population? If we don't change anything, we has the as is response. And then you could say, well, what if actually we get worse? <laughs> what if we actually uh, become less efficient? You can run those models. And then you can run models that say, what if we get ourselves together and we really shut things down? And, and work really hard at it. And then we have, say, what if we do a little bit? What if we do a whole bunch? So there's the whole range, 
and people have run these models and this is the so these are the changes we're looking at so uh most of these were produced in 2000 these models and then here's the the averages uh so i'm sorry here's each each scenario so the scenario where we do things worse predicts a change of about four degrees uh, Celsius. Some of these models I'm not showing actually show seven, which is um, a seven degree Celsius change uh, will give us an entire different planet. So that's, that's a little worrisome. With four degrees, you end up with a different planet, um, but with with really um, 2100, it's not that far away. Uh, that would mean uh, most of our coastal cities are actually lost. So New York City, Miami, New Orleans, uh, Tokyo, Hong Kong, that those cities are actually flooded. Uh, because then at that point, we've lost all our land ice. Uh, and then here are the other scenarios are in between. So even if we year 2000 constant concentrations, this bottom um, sort of pinkish colored one, even if we do that, we will have an increase in temperature. And that's because the lag time between putting out CO2 and then the thermal effects, there's actually a, a bit of a lag. So even when we cut things off, there'll be some warming, uh, but it'll hopefully we'll put things, uh, keep things in control. All right. So, I also want to show how CO2 emissions have broken down by country and where the U.S. stands as opposed to other countries. The first thing that jumps out at me is China. So China was ranked very low in the 1970s as a contributor to CO2. And then it increased in about the year 2000, increased exponentially. Um, the country built hundreds and hundreds of uh, coal burning plants to meet their demand for electricity and modernization. And thankfully that has stopped in about 2010. So although they're increasing, they're not increasing as rapidly, but they are now quite clearly the lead producer of CO2. So we need to get China to, to rein a little bit of that in. And they are actually are, China is addressing this issue and they're doing many things because they also have an air pollution issue problem along with the increase in CO2. Um, the United States for years uh, was the leader in CO2 emissions and uh, China overtook us in about 2004. And uh, now we're, we're a second, but we're still a very high emitter of CO2 uh, EU is the European Union, 28 countries. Uh, that was a close second. So realize there's this green line is a whole bunch of countries altogether. Of course, spatially, it's still smaller than the US, uh, but very industrialized. And they've been pretty steady and in fact have been dropping, right? So 2006 is the... Uh, or 2007 was the, the uh, Paris Agreement. And you could see that many, many countries have been dropping. And the other country I wanted to show, so lots of countries are holding steady. The one country I wanted to show was India. So India is an upcoming uh, major player in carbon dioxide emissions. All right. Tackling the climate issue. So this is, you know, what, what's happening. Uh, most of us recognize that climate change is, is not a great thing. Uh, you'll hear that CO2 is a plant food. Realize that that's limited. Most plants are limited by actually by uh, the soil, not by carbon dioxide. Um, so there's lots of nonsense out there related to this, but uh, many people do recognize um, the climate change issue and are addressing it. And what, what can be done? One is we can change agriculture. So we can use genetically modified plants and targeted fertilizing to reduce agricultural waste. 
So that would be a huge one, just reducing ag waste. Uh, reforesting, so uh, that's, that's important. Even if we planted millions and millions of trees that would not solve the, the climate crisis. Um, efficiency in automobiles and energy production and the way we use energy, so how it's produced and then how we use it. So increasing the efficiency would go very far in reducing our, our carbon footprint and then coordinating these efforts among nations. And um, the one thing, I mean, there's been other climate agreements. The latest one was the Paris Agreement of 2016. And what they do is they just provide targets. It's completely voluntary, uh, but they provide targets. And the big thing is just coordinating efforts, okay? Just coordinating how things are done. And so the example I think of is the Montreal Protocol where countries agreed voluntarily to reduce their CFCs. And um, because if you have somebody say, well, we're not going to, you could have people buying all their CFCs from that country. But if everybody agrees and coordinates this, then you could actually drop it down. So that's the point of the Paris Agreement is to coordinate these efforts, right? And, and to help other countries bring on technologies that help reduce uh, CO2 emissions. 196 countries signed on. Uh, there were a number that did not. Uh, they were relatively minor in their CO2 production. Uh, we signed on, the US signed on, and then withdrew November 4th, 2020. I mean, it became official. We actually uh, set in motion to withdraw the Paris Agreement, um, Donald Trump pushed that, and uh, but it just became in effect November fourth. And according to my calendar, today's November twelfth, so that means it's just been over a week that we withdrew. By withdrawing, we joined Iran and Turkey as only the three significant emitters emitters of CO two not included in the Paris Agreement. Iran and Turkey and the US. So uh, elections matter and we have uh, the US will very likely, hopefully have a new president. And uh, he said he's gonna rejoin the Paris Agreement. And uh, so that may actually affect carbon dioxide emission of the United States in the future and not just the United States, because we tend to be a leader in these things. Um, and because of the coordinated efforts, it actually will possibly impact the entire globe. Pretty amazing. All right, that's CO2, that's climate change and sea level rise and all that kind of fun stuff. I think this is the uh, last of the downers. And uh, I'm gonna try and introduce produce two more lectures and hopefully those will be uh, positive things we're doing to make the, the to uh, increase conservation efforts. All right, thanks. If you have any questions, send me an email.